compound return is what matters to us. It ma that's what we eat. You know, we don't eat this arithmetic average return. We eat the compound return. So even investors who are not taking any leverage in their portfolio at all, if they just have too much risk in there that they're not getting compensated for, uh, it really eats into their compound return. And then they can really make that whole situation much, much worse by, by adopting a spending policy that's kind of built over that expected returns. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. As regular viewers know, this channel's mission is focused on wealth building, how to help its viewers fund their life goals. And risk management is a big part of successfully building wealth. But many people, even sometimes the smartest guys on Wall Street, fail to adequately protect themselves from downside risk. Perhaps the best known example of this is the surprise implosion of the hedge fund long-term capital management back in the late 1990s. The firm was helmed by some of Wall Street's most revered talent, as well as several recipients of the Nobel Prize in Economics, and yet it failed spectacularly. What lessons can we learn from this? And what chance does the regular investor have in making good financial decisions over time when even the cream of the crop can get things so wrong? For answers, we're fortunate to hear from Victor Hagani, one of the co-founding partners of Long-Term Capital Management and co-author of the brand new book, The Missing Billionaires, A Guide to Better Financial Decisions. Victor, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Great to be on the show. Oh, it's a privilege to have you here. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. I kind of gave a little preview uh, of the wealthy on viewers that you were going to be coming on. Folks were very excited. So um, let's dive right into it. But if we can, let me just start with a question I like to begin all these interviews with. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, uh, you know, the way that uh, the way that I like to look and 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 the way my firm Elm Wealth likes to look at um, investing is very simply to think about um, we have more or less two major choices uh, in terms of where we put our money. We could put them into safe assets and you know your choice of safe asset is an important one you know it might be something like you know cash in the bank or treasury bills or it might be you know a longer term inflation protected investment but you've got your safe asset and then you've got your risky assets you know that are there to hopefully give you a higher return in um in you know uh, as a compensation for bearing the risk of them and so really we just look at uh, equities and 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 safe fixed income is the two major asset classes to think about. And so, when we look at equities right now, um, the um, you know the expected return of global equities isn't terrible. You know we think that uh, equities are are priced to give you know something like a four or five percent long term uh, real return, but uh, we've had a very big change in interest rates, and now you can earn. Um, you know, two and a half percent on a pretty safe, long-term inflation protected investment. And so the difference between those two, um, uh, between those two expected returns, uh, you know, is pretty narrow. And so we think that, that equities are not offering a very uh, good um, extra return for the risk that's involved in, in holding them. And the risks abound. I mean, there's always a lot of risk that's either apparent or just under the surface. You know, right now, I would say the risks are a little bit more apparent and the market is uh, a little bit more volatile now than it than it uh, typically is. So between risk being a bit elevated and the expected uh, extra return from owning equities being a bit narrow, uh, you know, we think that it's a time that um, people should own less equities than uh, they normally would, or that, or that they would, you know, in, um, you know, in other sorts of environments. So, uh, you know, we, so we kind of are a bit more cautious in terms of an investment stance. Now, I haven't really answered your question about the economy. Uh, you know, that's a really, you know, that's, you know, I think that the economy and uh, investing are somewhat um, uh, separate from each other. You know, like if you get, if you had a crystal ball and could tell me. You know what the next year's uh, GDP would be. Um, you know that might not really help me too much to have a good return on my investments. Um, so, 
Uh, but anyway, that's that's how I look. That's how we we're looking at the overall investing landscape right now. Okay, good. And and, and just to make sure the audience followed along, to sort of two things. One, you're saying from a risk return standpoint, equities uh, on a historical basis don't look so attractive right now. Um, when you talked about the ability to get a two and a half percent return, you know, pretty safe return in fixed income. I'm assuming you mean a real return because our audience knows we've talked a lot about, you know, where yields have been right now. They know that short term T-bills are over 5 percent. You're talking about a real return where you take that 5 percent and you subtract, you know, or, or five and a half, quarter, five and a half, and then you subtract the three something inflation number, right? That, that's right. I mean, in fact, I'm really talking about the yield that's offered by investing in treasury uh, inflation protected securities tips, you know, so so we don't even need to estimate inflation. We can just look at buying a 10 year inflation protected bond issued by the U.S. government, and that's yielding two and a half percent. So it's also consistent with what you said. But, you know, we can even just observe directly what is the real yield offered on safe government uh, government guaranteed investments right now. So two, that's the two and a half percent indeed is a real yield, not a, a nominal yield. Okay, great. All right. Um, okay, so thanks for setting you know your general perspective on how you see the markets. Now, as I said in the introduction, um, this conversation is going to have to do a lot with financial decision making and, and risk management. Um, you were part of the team there at Long Term Capital Management. I gave a little bit of a description of what it was um, in the introduction. But if you can, can you just sort of set the stage for us and explain how it was conceived. The firm was conceived. You know what it was. What, what it was hoping to do. I mentioned it recruited some of the best talent around, yourself included. I'm guessing you must have been about 12 years old when you joined, because you <laughs> certainly don't. Uh, you know, looking at, at at what your age must be, you must have been a very young man uh, during your time there. Um, and uh, you know, once we kind of know the story uh, about why it was created and what it was hoping to do, then if you can kind of paint the picture for us of, of how sort of all, it all went wrong. Sure. So, <clears throat> and so long-term capital management uh, was a hedge fund manager, um, L LTCM for short. And, um, and it, and it uh, came out of, uh, it, it, it kind of spun out of the Solomon brothers um, of the, uh, you know, of the 70s, 80s and early 90s. So we started to interrupt, but I mean, that was just a huge powerhouse on Wall Street at the time. That's right. I mean, Solomon was, uh, you know, was was one of the premier uh, trading houses, you know, particularly in the world of bonds and fixed income, uh, you know, was the preeminent uh, trading firm, underwriter uh, and innovator. I mean, that, that a, a lot of financial market innovation came out of Solomon Brothers, a lot of um, developments in the mortgage back market that that uh, made mortgages more um, or they made uh, house buying more affordable by having lower mortgage rates and a more efficient mortgage market. You know, many of those innovations came out of the mortgage department at Solomon Brothers. Also, you know, Solomon was a leader in uh, in interest rate swaps and and uh, interest rate options and all kinds of different uh, financial innovations um, that were going on at the time. Not the only place where innovation was happening, but you know, one of the you know one of the uh, leaders. You know of of the firms that were doing that. So within Solomon Brothers, um, there was a group of of uh, people led by John Merriweather, who had been there since the 1970s, and um, and Solomon uh, and Solomon liked uh, and found it very rewarding to have some of its capital, um, you know, managed in a proprietary way, um, you know, put at risk in different uh, transactions in the marketplace. I mean, really, everybody was doing that at the time. And Solomon, um, you know, was was doing that quite aggressively and had a very good um, track record and return uh, for the capital that it dedicated to proprietary trading. Now, these days, banks are not allowed to do that. That was an outgrowth of the financial market crisis in 08, where um, rules were put in place to uh, really uh, not allow banks to um, to to do this sort of uh, proprietary trading um, after it went spectacularly wrong in the global financial crisis of of 08. Um, 
But back then, you know, it was just a very typical thing, you know, particularly in investment banks. And back then there was a real dichotomy between investment banks and commercial banks. Solomon was a uh, was an investment bank, you know, after, again, after the uh, or during the global financial crisis um, to try to uh, shore up the financial system. Investment banks kind of went away and really got merged with commercial banks. And of course, you know, there was the repeal of Glass-Steagall that that happened earlier than that. So investment and commercial banks were converging before that, too. But anyway, so. Um, uh, so Solomon had this this uh, this history and tradition of proprietary trading. Uh, and then um, in uh, in 1992, I think uh, there was a Treasury uh, auction scandal involving Solomon Brothers, where um, uh, where um, the head of the government desk um, uh, or the, the government bond trading desk, which was, you know, one of the leading um, profitable and respected desks within the firm, uh, got in trouble for trying to buy too much of the U.S. Uh, Treasury issuance in a few cases and a few auctions. And there was a whole shakeup at the firm. And my boss, John Merriweather, wound up uh, leaving Solomon. And uh, once he was outside of Solomon, a lot of people came to him and said, hey, you know, why do you want to go back to Solomon? Why don't you start a hedge fund and do what you were doing at Solomon, but do it outside? And we'd like to, you know, we'd like to give you some of the capital to do that. And we'll pay you a higher fraction of the profits, let's say, than what was happening at Solomon Brothers. And you'll have a much nicer life. You know, you'll just be, you know, out on your own doing this. And anyway, you know, um, you know, John uh, decided uh, to give this a try. And then yeah, a bunch they, of us. They, they know, made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Yeah. And then a bunch of us left Solomon to join him. And we set up LTCM, which was really trying to do what we were doing within Solomon, but now doing it, you know, in a, uh, you know, in a specialized pool of capital um, and, and trying to do it outside of Solomon. So that was the genesis of it. Um, you know, it, it uh, you know, it turned out that that wasn't such a great business idea in the end, that, that it probably made a lot more sense to do this activity that we were doing within a large financial institution, you know, as opposed to being a monoline to be, uh, you know, to be part of this big financial institution was was, uh, you know, I, I think in retrospect, you know, was a much better way to uh, to do this business. Although, you know, today, 25 years later, there's lots of uh, places that are doing the same sorts of things that we were doing at LTCM, uh, you know, 25 years later, um, you know, there's still places that that do that because it's, you know, it, it uh, you know, at least on the surface, it looks like a very attractive uh, you know, proposition to, uh, you know, to do that sort of trading. So I'll stop, okay. I'll stop there. Um, you know. Okay. So you, you've set the stage for us. Um, I think you also recruited, um, uh, uh, gosh, uh, well, Fisher yeah, Black, the, 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 no, the developers of the, the Black Shoals. No, no, Myron, model. well, Myron Shoals and Bob Merton, but we didn't, you know, I would say that we didn't really recruit them, you know, in the sense that, um, uh, Bob and Myron and and all of us were like working together still at Solomon Brothers. So, uh, you know, yes, you could say it was recruited, but in a sense, you know, we had been all together at Solomon Brothers. And then, you know, a lot of us went on and moved to LTCM. So the group kind of stayed intact. So Bob and Myron were already um, involved at Solomon Brothers, you know, you know, maybe less involved, you know, they became like these full-time partners at LTCM. And when they were both uh, working and consulting at Solomon Brothers, you know, it was much more part-time. But these really, you know, but we didn't like start LTCM and then say, oh, let's go recruit those guys. You know, they were really part of it. And Bob, Bob was really there. Bob, Bob was, um, uh, you know, at uh, sort of at the very founding of LTCM right at the very, very beginning Um you know, as okay, well. so so I, I think the the narrative that was out there was you know they recruited a dream team um, to come run LTCM, but it sounds like what you're saying is, is the dream team was actually already together beforehand. Yeah, they just yeah. kind of trundled over together. Yeah, really, it was, it was a spin out. Yeah, it was a spin out rather than sort of some whole new construction. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But but I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but still LTCM and its founding was touting. Hey, we have all this talent on this team, right? We've got John Merriweather, 
Well, um, I wouldn't say, yeah, I wouldn't say there was any touting going on. I mean, you know, that we, we you know, that, that people came to us, like we weren't doing any real marketing, you know, people came to us, we didn't do any touting, like we have a dream team or anything like that. We were there and people knew about us and people wanted to give us capital. And then we stopped taking capital after a, a year or so. So there wasn't, you know, I don't think there was really, I, I think touting wouldn't be the right description okay. of what was going on. It wasn't, we weren't a money gathering operation. We were a trading operation and people wanted to give us money. People, you know, that we were a known, we were a known quantity in the marketplace and, you know, institutions wanted to invest with us. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and as I say, you know, we closed, we were closed to new investments very shortly after we got started. Oh, that's fascinating. It's, it's, it's so interesting talking to you here, right? Is, is, you know, a myth grows over time, right? And you're sort of helping us understand what was real and what wasn't. So basically, a spin out team was already together. They came over, you guys weren't even kind of dialing for capital, the dollars were finding you of people saying, we like you guys, please take our money. Okay, so now you're funded, you're, you're, you're independent from Solomon Brothers. Um, T tell us the story. What, what were you doing, and then what went wrong in the model that that ended up, you know, ending the firm? Sure. So, well, we were doing the types of things that we had been doing at Solomon Brothers. We were doing, uh, you know, relative value trading. Uh, sometimes it's called arbitrage trading, although the the pure definition of arbitrage is doing risk free, um, you know, f finding you know risk free ways of making money. And clearly, what we were doing was not risk free, and we knew that and you know, we didn't call it arbitrage. It was relative value trading of finding two things that are very, very similar and buying one and selling the other. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, in the, in the hope and the, in the expectation that, that their pricing will become more similar or converge over time. Uh, you know, very often these things have a date with destiny where they actually become the same thing at some horizon. You know, not just that they start to price similarly, but they actually become the same, you know, that you can take this one and deliver it there. And, you know, as long as you've held it, as long as you've been able to hold it till that horizon, um, you know, that it actually does converge. Of course, the holding it to that horizon is the is the catch in the in the whole thing. Um, and um, that when you're finding things that are very similar to each other, right, the more similar things are to each other, the closer their prices are to each other. And yes, there's this uh, convergence that that you hope is going to take place ultimately. Uh, and there's risk, you know, it's sort of there since they're not the same, they're moving around, you know, relative to each other. And then eventually you hope they converge. Um, uh, but when they're very similar to each other, that discrepancy in price is 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 going to be very small. And so, um, you know, to make it attractive for people to give you capital to do these things, you wind up using leverage to take a small difference in price and a small convergence that you hope will happen, and to make that um, you know give a, a, a you know an adequately high return on capital for people to want to take some of their capital and take it out of the stock market or other things and have it be invested in this type of activity and so typically um, you know depending on how close those things are together you might use five times leverage or ten times leverage or twenty times leverage depending on how similar they are how risky they are relative to each other etc and you're sort of hoping you know when we started LTCM we uh, told investors that we hoped that we could make, you know, a 10 or 15 percent return on capital from doing this activity, um, you know, with a, a level of risk of, you know, of 10 or 15 percent per year, something like, you know, in that in that vicinity. Now, it turned out that in our first uh, four years of operation, you know, that um, on a before fee basis, we made like 40 percent a year, which was very surprising to us. You know, we realized that uh, you know what was happening is that that um, that that more and more capital was coming into the sorts of things that we were doing, and and sort of that we were doing them, and we were riding this wave of other capital coming in and doing the same sorts of trades and forcing convergences uh, faster than um, than than we would have expected, and so returns were much much higher. Um, and we kind of felt that um, the opportunity set was not really growing. And so we decided to return, uh, I don't know, about a third of our capital. We returned it to investors at the end of 1997. 
you know, our investors weren't very happy with that. They they wanted to keep their money in the They business. wanted to still be in the game because it yeah, was they making wanted so to still much be for in them. The game, yeah. But of course, you know, it turned out to be to have the silver, you know, to uh um to uh to have a silver lining for them and that, you know, they wound up getting back um, you know, more than their even original investment. And so even after the firm the the value of the hedge fund went down 90% in 2000 in um, 1998 that those investors that got those big redemptions at the end of 97 you know still wound up with like a 20% IRR on their investments now you know sort of just cutting to the chase you know at the end of 1998 or towards the, in the summer of 98 and then you know into September and October the fund suffered uh dramatic losses of down uh you know, down 20, 30, 50%, you know, and as this was happening, we were trying to raise more investor capital. There were a lot of investors that wanted to invest with us, but once we were, you know, sort of in this uh, downward, uh, you know, steep downward uh, trend, people were changing their mind. And, and, and so we weren't able to raise that capital. We felt we were close to it, but it didn't ever uh, materialize. And then ultimately um, our biggest bank counterparties, uh, took over our portfolio. They put in uh, three and a half or so billion dollars and they bought the fund at down 90% uh, on the year um, and, uh, and and effectively recapitalized it. And then um, we uh, helped them to, uh, to liquidate that fund over the next year. So from by the end of 1999, we had pretty much liquidated all of the positions of LTCM and you know they were they were good positions, and so even over that ensuing one year, the returns were okay. I don't know. We, I think we made like ten percent for that consortium of banks, and a lot of the trades then, you know, longer term went on to be, uh, you know, very good trades for you know the the different pools of capital that owned them afterwards. So. Uh, so the fund, you know, the fund basically, so the, the management company uh, went out of business, you know, after that LTCM uh, went away. Um, the, um, the biggest investors in the fund in 1998 were the partners, our, you know, we, the partners ourselves, uh, we still had outside investors. Uh, but as I was saying, you know, the outside investors had gotten most of their capital back um, at the end of 97, but they still had capital with us. And that capital went down 90% in 1998. It was very um, traumatic and, um, and um, you know, very traumatic for everybody involved uh, in it. Um, and, um, but, you know, I think that the, you know, that when you started the, when you started the discussion on this, you know, it's like, well, you know, sort of what went wrong or whatever. Well, you know, that, you um, investments are risky, you know, and so like, I think that the, uh, the, the books and articles and so on that were written afterwards were like, well, how can you lose 90% on your investments? Well, lots of investments go down 90%, lots of investments go down 100%, you know, that, that more than, um, you know, the number of companies that have started uh, in, you know, in business, um, uh, you know, and, and become public companies, you know, that, that many, many public companies uh, failed, you know, despite having really good businesses and really good businesses ideas, uh, really good business ideas, you know, at their inception. So like in some ways, yes, it's kind of, it's, it's, uh, it was a really big deal. It was a really interesting story. You know, how did, uh, how did LTCM, how did this fund go down so much and lose so much money? Um, but, you know, I think in some ways that's just investing, you know, that that sometimes uh, it was it was it was particularly interesting because this was such a great case study of like really good trades, but in too big of a size, uh, you know, leading to a bad compound return, you know, that the um, uh, that, that there was just too much. Ultimately, there was too much risk and the size of the trades were too big, but that the trades themselves were overall good sound long-term investments you know just they changed hands the owners of those trades changed hands from the ltcm investors to other investors out there wound up uh you know benefiting from the fact that they were good investments uh longer term so um so you know bringing it bringing it back to you know i think where you started is like what are the lessons that can be learned um 
uh, for your listeners and your um, viewers, um, you know, I think that getting, you know, that that uh, that that markets are very hard to predict. So that selecting the good investments, um, you know, is 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 one part of the investment process. But the other part is once you've identified what you think are good investments, you have to decide how much of those investments individually and in aggregate you want to own and you know that's this how much question so there's the what question what should i invest in and then there's the how much question the uh the risk question and um and ltcm is this kind of wonderful case study that really um is uh you know that that i think people can agree that the what that that ltcm kind of had the what question more or less correct you know that we identified good things, but you can see that if you identify good things, but you get the how much question wrong, that can end in a in a terrible outcome. Whereas if you get the what question wrong, but you get the how much question right, you survive and you get another chance in the future to, to uh, try to make your selection decision, your what decision. And the book that we've written, which I guess we'll start talking about soon, the book that, uh, that me and my partner, James White, uh, have just published, um, it, you know, is really focused on trying to get people to think about this how much question. There's so much, you know, 99, we we say that 99.9% .9 of uh, the discussion that's out there in the media or even in the main uh, academic um, uh, flow of flow of ideas is about the the what question. And we feel that this how much question doesn't get enough attention. And so we wrote a book that's really focused on the how much and LTCM, as I say, is I think a really great case study in how important it is to get the how much question right or how critical it can be when you get that wrong. Great. So, uh, Victor, we have financial advisors that come on this channel week after week um, to help people kind of kind of let them crawl in the minds of a professional you know, client capital manager. And one of the things that they stress an awful lot is position sizing. And I have a sense that that's sort of a lot of what you're talking about here, right? Which that's the how much, and it is. It's something that I think is very much underappreciated. Everybody wants to know what to be in, but getting that question of, okay, yes, you might want to be in this, but how much of it should you be in, right? Um, so anyways, you're probably going to get a nice fruit basket from those advisors at, at the end <laughs> of this discussion. So yes, let, let's let's go into the the, the key insights of your, your book now. And you're, a couple quotes from it I want to read here. Real quickly, just because it's kind of scratching at my brain, I'm, I'm suspecting it's scratching at the brain of a few other people. Just going back to the LCM story in a moment, for a moment, it sounds like it sounds like concentration, maybe over concentration of position, might have been an issue. And of course, you said you used a lot of leverage. If if you can if you can just tell us your best assessment of like what changed in the winds, right? You you had a model that was making. Great returns, forty percent returns. It sounds like annually for the first four years, um, enough that to your your credit, you gave enough back to investors that even with the subsequent ninety percent loss, they still had a positive gain on their initial investments. I mean, that's that's amazing. Um, but was there something that changed in the market that that sort of invalidated the the main thesis of what you were investing in? Was there a, was there a macro change that all of a sudden made the assets that you were buying perform differently? You know, was there some rogue wave like that that happened? Um, no, no, I wouldn't say you know I wouldn't say like a, a, a rogue wave or some crazy thing that happened. Um, uh, that um, I mean, first of all, right that you mentioned a model, you know, we didn't, we, you know, that, that our investing was not a model based form of investing that, um, I mean, you know, we used, uh, we used valuation models to assess the value of different things that we were looking at, but the, um, the decision to do trades was really a very, uh, you know, was, was, uh, much, much beyond any sort of quantitative model that we were looking at flows and, you know, what's the explanation for this divergence in value, what's going to happen to make it go away, what are the micro, um, what are the micro features of the market that cause the market to be sufficiently segmented for this to happen? Are there tax things? Are they going to get worse? Are they going to get better? You know, et cetera. So, so there was a lot that went into the the decisions, and um, you know that that um, 
that what happened in 1998 was that um, uh, there was a pullback in liquidity that um, that banks were uh, reducing the balance sheet that they wanted to have exposed to counterparties like us and you know within their within their own uh, balance sheets as well. So in early 1998, for instance, um, Citigroup that was then being run by Sandy Weil and uh, Jamie Dimon decided that they didn't want to have so much of their bank balance sheet in these proprietary trading sorts of positions that were similar to what that what we were doing at LTCM. So they uh, sort of disbanded the, the group of people that was doing it, and they started to liquidate those positions and put pressure onto those decisions, uh, sorry, onto those positions. There was a pullback in liquidity. Other firms like Goldman, uh, or Lehman were also losing money. We were losing money, uh, and and you know it was it sort of just became uh, you know a very bad time for these trades, and so uh, you know we've seen that we had seen that before, and we saw that in much bigger waves in two thousand and eight. You know the right. the, um, the divergences that that happened then were even bigger than what happened in nineteen ninety eight. So um, you know I think that. Uh, what happened, you know, in 1998 to LTCM was not especially unusual. You know, I think it's something that happens, you know, every five, 10, 15 years, you know, since the 1970s. You know, it, it was unfortunate that that we, you know, that eventually the market started to look at what LTCM had and, and you know, got worried about those different trades, you know, that, you know, who, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, um, you know, if we had been smaller, if we had had different trades, you know, we would have survived that and and kept going, you know, maybe somebody else would have gone under, I don't know. But, um, you know, no, I don't think that it was, I don't think there was like a major macro event that happened or a rogue wave okay. or anything like well, that. But, but I think you've answered the question, which is it basically was a, a change in liquidity flows. You had mentioned you were expecting to make 10 to 15% per year. You made more because more, more parties were starting to put money into this space. They started taking money out of the space and it just changed the game a bit, it sounds like. And of course, you yeah. were over concentrated and over leveraged or, or highly leveraged. And that kind of made it all worse once the market got got jittery. But OK, that, that was what I was looking for. So, OK, so getting to your book here, you and your co-author, James White, had this to say, which I thought was a really concise way to put it. Collectively, we face a really big and pervasive problem when it comes to making good financial decisions. Even the most financially successful members of our society, at least some of whom were smart and capable and all of whom could afford the, quote, best financial advice, consistently made atrocious financial decisions. What should we expect from the rest of us? Right. So uh, you, you go from that and you talk about um uh, you know, some of the key lessons from from long term capital management, uh, which is that almost as much as you can get is almost never the correct answer uh, to how much of a good thing is right for you. Right. So we get into the OK, you got to manage your exposure, you got to manage your position sizing. Um, but this this higher level question, which I think most people watching, you know, this current video listening to you saying is, my gosh, you know, even if the pros can kind of get caught by that and and can fall guilty of not making the best financial decisions. What what chance do I as the little fish have? So how is your book helping people learn to make better financial decisions? Uh, you know, that I, that I hope what our book is doing is getting people to really focus on this how much decision, you know, as I said, as I said earlier, and that um, that the how much decision, like people might think that, well, you know, as long as I, you know, if I have 60% of my money in the stock market, um, you know, is the how much decision really that important to me? Um, you know, like I'm not going to lose all of my money. I'm not going to, you know, I'm 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 not taking that much risk where it's a problem. But um, you know, it kind of depends on how you have your money invested in the stock market too. If you have a lot of idiosyncratic risk, so you have yeah, you, know, you have sixty percent of your money in the market, but um, you know, you have a lot of Tesla and Apple. And uh, and Nvidia, you know, whatever, and and it's like, oh, this has been great, you know, and and all of a sudden you wake up one day and it's like, well, well, now those things have done so well. I started off with sixty percent of my money in the market, but now you know it's more like eighty percent of my money is in stocks, twenty right. percent in bonds, and my portfolio has got a lot of concentration. And so instead of the fifteen to twenty percent risk of being in 
the fully diversified global stock market. Uh, you know, instead, I have sort of a, you know, I have I have a portfolio that's got a fair amount of concentration to it. And I have and I'm running like twice as much variability, twice as much risk as I would have from a very diversified stock portfolio. Remember that, you know, one individual stock tends to be two to three times riskier than a diversified holding in the stock market. And um, and you, and and it's like, OK, well, so so what? You know, is that really a big deal? Well, yes, it is really a big deal because uh if you let's let's say that I let's say that I guarantee you that you're going to make uh you know a five percent extra return relative to the safe asset on average over the next thirty years, I'm gonna I guarantee that to you, right? I say, no matter what, um, when you add up each year's return and average them all together, that you will have made five percent more than uh than the safe asset, okay? And um, let's say the safe asset is yielding zero, just to make it easy, which not sure. too long ago it was, um, just to make the math easy. But it's going to be five. It's going to average out to five percent a year. There's no risk whatsoever in that outcome. Uh, but each year, there's you know that you have a pretty concentrated portfolio, and each year it's going to have volatility of say thirty percent. You know, just to make this a little bit more extreme. You know, even less extreme, you still have this effect. And you say, okay, well, um, so what does that mean? It means that really one year the market goes up 35% and the next year my portfolio goes down 25%. So if over two years I made 35% one year and the next year I lost 25%, well, my average return is 5% a year, right? Because 35 minus 25 is 10 divided by two years. That's my five percent return. So it just let's say the market just keeps doing that every uh, every two years, you know, for thirty years. So there it is. I had a five percent extra return relative to the safe asset. But what happens is that that risk is eating into my compound return. So actually, if I have a hundred dollars and I make thirty five percent the first year, now I have one hundred and thirty five dollars. And then if it goes down by 25% the next year, I only have $101. And so my compound return is only half a percent a year mm. uh, per year. So if I have 5% a year of extra return each year, but I'm taking all this risk of 30% a year, my compound return is only a half a percent a year. I'm losing 4.5% per year in 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 the risk eating into my compound return and so and compound return is what matters to us it ma that's what we eat you know we don't eat this arithmetic average return we eat the compound return so even investors who are not taking any leverage in their portfolio at all if they just have too much risk in there that they're not getting compensated for uh it really eats into their compound return and then they can really make that whole situation much much worse by by adopting a spending policy that's kind of built over that expected return. So they say, well, geez, I'm making 5% more per year than uh, the safe asset. So geez, I, you know, I, let, let me do, let me spend, uh, I'll, I'll spend based upon those expectations. But if you start spending based on this average expectation, but your compound return is much lower, but you're spending at this higher rate, you're dissipating your wealth really much more quickly than you think you are or you think you will. And, you know, I think that's I think those are these subtle effects that are really hurting uh, uh, the preservation and growth of wealth in in many, many people's portfolios. I think, uh, you know, that's really what to, I think that's that's really the lesson that we're trying to uh, or the ideas that we're trying to get across in the book. Um, you know, it's not about how big should you be in in leveraged uh, hedge fund positions. You know, that's not that's not relevant to ninety nine point nine percent of the people. But what is is like how much risk am I running in my own portfolio, and and realizing how important it is to get that right, and how to have a spending policy and an investment policy that are consistent with each other. Those are the main ideas we're trying to get across in the book, and and they're relevant for everybody. So, um, yeah, that's a great explanation. And um, you know, our this is a rant for a different day, Victor. But our our education system 
does a terrible job of teaching financial literacy. Um, and most people, and I, I know this very well because I hear it every day from viewers of this channel, you know, most people feel like they've kind of been thrust out into their adult life uh, unprepared uh, to be good capital managers of their own wealth. And uh, the average American um, eschews math is, I think, a polite way to say it. You know, <laughs> they, when, when things get a little mathy, they, 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 it starts to get really confusing and complicated for folks, which means they either just don't think about it, or in your case, you know, maybe they, they're doing math that's just too basic, right? That's leading them to faulty conclusions. Like, oh, if I'm going to get roughly 5%, if I'm going to beat the, the safe asset by 5% every year, I can spend more, but they're not realizing that the compound returns a lot less and they're actually probably, you know, putting themselves on a path to failure without being aware of it. So I'm going to guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to guess that you are probably a big fan of, uh, you know, people developing a financial plan, whether it's working with a, a financial professional who's got software to do that or using some of the, the tools and software that are available for DIY folks, but, but actually looking at the math itself not doing back of the envelope cocktail math or fuzzy number in your head math, but actually like really putting, you know, hard numbers and estimates into calculators that will project for you. So you can make truly factual decisions about, you know, important decisions like how much to save to your point, what to put it in and what are, what are rational position sizes for the, the investments you're going to have. But then more importantly, okay, what are my expected returns? What should I be trying to do from a, a, a cost management standpoint and my budget? Uh, you know, what can I afford to spend? All that type of stuff. You're sort of nodding as I'm saying this, but I, I, to me, that's a big conclusion I'm taking from your work here. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we think that that um, we think it's really important for people to give hard hard thought to uh, to their investment portfolios, their spending policies, um, and. Um, you know, I don't I don't think it has to be complicated or, uh, you know, I don't think that you need sophisticated software packages to to do this. You just need to have a grasp of the of the basics um, that are there. And so um, but, yeah, I mean, we're really advocates of people either, uh, you know, we're we're advocates you know, of, of people sort of really figuring things out and 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 um, uh you know, being masters of their own of their own uh, financial destiny, that it's not that complicated. You know, if you feel that you need a financial advisor, that's that's great. They can help you in many different ways. Um, but you know, our basic, you know, our basic belief is that um, that finance is not uh, is not like being your own doctor or being your own surgeon. You know, that it's, <laughs> or being your own dentist. You know, it's. You know, maybe it's more like being your own hairdresser. Like, can you blow dry your own hair or do you need somebody to blow dry it? <laughs> you know, maybe the professional blow dryer does a better job, but, you know, you can blow dry your hair if if, uh, if you ha if you have any. So I think that um, we're at, you know, we're definitely advocates, though, of, of thinking about things in a really systematic, um, in a systematic way uh, and not, you know, sort of all fuzzy and, uh you know, all fuzzy and and sort of accepting, you know, like we don't believe that, you know, we don't believe that somebody can, that that uh, that if you say, um, if, if we say to somebody like, um, look, uh, let's assume that stocks are going to give you an extra 5% relative to safe assets and that, you know, stocks bounce around by 15 to 20% per year. And every once in a while, they go down by 50 or 60 or 70%. That's stocks. Now, given that, how much stocks do you want to own? And if somebody says to us, like, oh, I can't answer that question. Well, if you can't answer that question, you can't you can't invest. You can't own any stocks like you need to think about that and find a way to answer that. You can't you know that if that if you can't answer that, then you can't just say, well, I'm just going to have 60 percent in stocks. You know, like you need to be able to answer that question. I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's beyond people to answer. You know, it's like, OK. Um, well, well, let's dig into that if we can, because, because I think probably a number of folks watching are saying, I don't necessarily know what the right percentage for me is. H how would you counsel them to sort of think it through? Well, the, um, you know, if it's easier to, uh, to think about it in, uh, you know, away from the stock market to begin with, and just think about how they would feel about seeing their wealth go up or down by a certain amount, you know, sort of take, 
maybe take the stock market out of it a little bit and say, okay, well, imagine, you know, you're flipping a coin and, you know, that the coin has a 70% chance of landing on heads and a 30% chance of landing on tails. And, um, you know, how much of your wealth do you want to bet on that? You know, and let's say you get to bet on that, you know, for five flips, you know, over the, each one of them representing one year over the next five years or, you know, so that by thinking about that, you know, it starts to help you to think about, you know, what's your what is your personal trade off between uh, expected return? So a 70 30 coin and betting on heads has this really nice expected return to it. Right. You're going to you're going to win more than two times as many times as you're going to lose. But there still is a risk of getting three tails in a row. And so by thinking about things in this very more more abstract a uh, simplified world of coin flips, it helps you to start to get a feel for your own risk preferences. And once you get that, once you start to calibrate just how risk averse or not you are, uh, you know, then you can start to um, uh, bring in the more realistic world of stock investing, you know, where it's not like a coin flip, but there is a risk and there is a return and you need to think about what those are to, to reach your decision. So, um, you know, I think that's just one way. I mean, there's a lot of different ways of, of coming at it. But effectively, uh, you know, in the end, you're going to be thinking about, OK, um, I want to get compensated for taking risk. And how much compensation do I need, uh, you know, given my preferences and my financial situation? And, you know, that's going to take into account also how old you are and how big is your human capital and what's the nature of your human capital? What, um you know, what's your family system? What, you know, what's your family support system? What's your health? What, how many dependents do you have? All these different things eventually come into it. But, you know, fundamentally, um, you know, we all are risk averse. We all should require compensation uh, for bearing risk. If we're not risk averse, then we're not going to have our money for long. <laughs> right. Um uh, you know, that if we're risk seeking, there's plenty of ways to find risks that uh, um, that you're not compensated for. And, and you can just, you know, flip <laughs> flip fair coins to your uh, or flip coins that are biased against you to your heart's content until you have no money left. Right. That's the Jim Grant uh, return free risk. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that people can really I think that everybody can can do that. And, uh, you know, we hope that our book uh helps people to uh to to realize how important it is to do that and how doable it is it's not it's not super complicated um it's something that everybody can do and again you know if you need some help from financial advisor that's great i mean financial advisors can can be super helpful in um uh you know in personal financial decisions and 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 helping you to be sensible and and uh, strict and disciplined about what you're doing Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I look at it sort of like maybe auto maintenance or maybe, um, you know, sort of handiness around the home. Right. Which is another one of those is rocket science. You know, you can you can learn to get good, good at both. And uh, and you should you should have some at, at least at a minimum, some basic fundamental understandings about how your car works, you know, know how to change a flat tire or your battery or the oil or whatever. Um, but there may be a, a level of sophistication of repair that maybe at some point you're like, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Maybe I actually should be calling, you know, taking the car to the mechanic or, hey, I can do some basic woodwork around the house. But, you know, if I'm going to muck around with the plumbing, I should probably get a plumber in for this job because I could really the downside risk is too high for my level of confidence in this yet. Right. So I think it's very similar, you know, for with, with finances, which is we should all be invested enough in learning the process to have agency in it and to at least know what intelligent questions that we want to ask of our advisors if we pull them in, but to increasingly, if possible, be more and more masters of our own destiny as we get better and better. I, th I think that's a big crux of the problem today, where I sort of talked about how bad the education system uh, fails us in teaching this, is that people have no confidence, and so they just abdicate it all. Right. And they don't even have the wherewithal oftentimes to know the difference between a good or a bad advisor. Uh, and I can't tell you how many horror stories we have of people who you know, are coming from an advisor who basically just took their money and, you know, probably would have served them better by throwing darts uh, than what they did with it. Right. Um, but the person at the, at the time didn't have enough knowledge to be able to discern whether that advisor was quality or, or earning their their fees. 
Um, so anyways, I'm a huge fan of people developing as much personal agency in the story as well. It sounds like that's a core message of your book. Um, and beginning to wrap up here in a minute, I'm going to ask where people can can get the book. But um, you, you do talk in the book about um, wealth building for young people. And if we could just talk about that for a moment, um, that's where you can make the biggest impact over the course of a lifetime, right, is, is the greatest asset that an investor has is time. Right. And the youth obviously have the most time, hopefully, ahead of them. Um, but in a lot of ways, when they're being disturbed by the, the education system, as I talked about, but they also, you know, I, I think it is true. Every every generation thinks, you know, they're getting a raw deal um, versus the previous one. But I think it's it's very true in, in today's younger generations, especially from an affordability standpoint. Right. When you look at at multiples of of the income it takes to afford the average home, that type of thing. Um, it, it's, you know, it, it's a tough slog for today's younger generation. So I think anything we can do to help them out in, in getting started on a better financial footing is, is, is really valuable. So I'm curious, you know, w- what are some of the key things that you wanted to impart through your book about this? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, um, you know, I think that, uh, the financial decisions of young people in their 20s or early 30s um, is probably like the uh, the area where academic finance uh, is um, is is kind of perhaps the most at odds with good common sense uh, advice. Right. So the um, you know, from an academic point of view, you know, when we think about these life cycle models, you know, the idea is that like, um, over a lifetime that we should try to sort of um, smooth out our consumption, you know, that um, that that, um, you know, smooth it out, you know, maybe it's slowly growing or whatever. And so if you really want smooth consumption and you're starting off early in life, you know, uh, and you're at the early part of life, you know, that's going to tell you that, oh, you know, you should uh, borrow money uh, to spend it because later on you're going to make more money and save more money and, and so on. And I think that, um you know, I, th- I mean, that's sort of just the very sort of high level, uh, you know, theory of life cycle investing. But, you know, academics and practitioners realize that uh, that that's not really such a great way to go about it. And so <laughs> like um, developing, uh, you know, a saving program, even from a young, you know, from a young age, even when your income is relatively low, um, you know, we think is 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 a really great approach to the financial decisions. Um you know, uh, to your lifetime financial decision. So even if there's like some argument that, yeah, you know, you're young, you have a lot of human capital, you want to smooth out your your consumption. So actually, why don't you, you know, borrow against those future earnings that you're going to have? You know, we think that, no, I mean, try to save, you know, 10, 15%, you know, put it into a tax advantage, uh, you know, you know, a 401k if your employer is offering it or an IRA if if not, um, and just get into this, you know, just develop this habit of saving, you know, 10 to 15 percent uh, of your uh, of your income and whatever that means in terms of consumption, you know, so be it. You know, you have to make those sacrifices to start to build up, um, you know, some financial capital, both for emergencies, but even more so, you know, for um you know, for 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 later in your life, for building your future. Yeah. So this is sort of the pay yourself model, right, which is write that check to your. 401k your IRA first and then figure out how you're going to pay the rest of your bills. Yeah, so I think you know developing a good saving habit from from the beginning is important, you know, not having credit card debt is important. Um, you know, I think the uh you know getting on the housing ladder is not is not critical. I think that sometimes people, you know, feel like that's an imperative or they might just live in a place where there's very little good rental uh stock that's available. So that's a that's a you know, that's it's hard to give really general advice around, uh, you know, getting on the housing ladder. Um, but, um, you know, I do think if anything, you know, maybe people are a little bit, you know, people, you know, sometimes people get a little overextended there. And then, you know, just have a really simple investment plan, you know, invest uh, in global equities, try to choose a percentage that you think you're comfortable with and makes sense. I wouldn't use leverage, but at the same time, I wouldn't be at 20 or 30 percent, you know, you have a lot of human capital, you're young. So it's OK, you know, assuming that your human capital is not super correlated with the stock market, um, you know, you could have a pretty high equity allocation, stick to that, keep it simple, 
you know, don't worry about it too much because your financial capital is small. You don't need to worry about it a lot. And, you know, and like, don't trade zero day options and don't you know <laughs> be a meme stock investor and this sort of thing. Like, just don't waste your time. It's not productive. Uh, it's not fulfilling. Um, you know, it just, it just is, it's just a terrible use of time. I mean, there's so many other things in life that are so much more uh, rewarding and satisfying, you know, and, and, you know, I know, how much fun it could be. You know, I know, I mean, I, I used to play video games when I was younger. <laughs> I love video games, you know, and, and yeah, this trading of stocks, zero commission and so on, you know, it feels like a really fun, like maybe the most fun kind of uh, game you can play so much better than going to Vegas and playing slots. Um, but, and, and probably the odds are better that you win, you know, doing it, uh, you know, in your brokerage account, but even so, uh, you know, that's a really low bar to say, well, this is better than going to Vegas. Okay. Right. Yeah, maybe it is, you know, <laughs> but, but it doesn't you, mean that doesn't mean the odds still aren't in the house's favor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's not as bad, but it's, it's just really bad. So, you know, I'd say, you know, just avoid all of that. That is not, I mean, I know some people say, oh, this is really good because it's part of your financial education. Like, no, you know, you can get financially educated many other ways. You don't need to lose most of your savings to get financial education. Uh, you can benefit from the experience of other people. You can, you know, learn in many other ways. So I would say just, you know, stay sensible, stay disciplined and put your, you know, put your uh, your bandwidth and, and mental cycles into the many other things out there that are going to be much more potentially rewarding than than that so you know, i think i'm sure that i'm echoing you know what um many many uh people say um yeah i'm 61 years old so you know i'm sure that uh this this message sounds you know won't won't sound maybe that convincing to younger people but you ask <laughs> well hey you know th 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 there's a reason why some advice is timeless right um <laughs> yeah. So I, I get the impression, uh, last question on this this thing, and then we'll we'll, we'll get to where to buy the book. Um, I, I get the impression that for most people, you would encourage them, especially earlier on in their, their investing journey, um, to be investing in ETFs um, versus individual stocks for the diversification standpoint and, and, and you know, therefore some risk reduction. Um, a, is that true? And if it is, where, where do you think the line is between when an investor, you know, can and should potentially start graduating to thinking about adding individual stocks to their portfolio? So, yes. Or, uh, or individual, in, individual securities, because you could be buying bonds as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yes, uh, um, you know, I think that um, that low cost low cost, very broad market cap weighted ETFs are terrific. You know, it's a terrific, terrific innovation that, um, you know, really has only been with us, uh, you know, for the last 15 years or so. And, you know, yes, we had an S&P 500 index fund going back to the early 90s or whatever, or, or ETF going back to the early 90s. But in terms of really being able to build a diversified, low cost, tax efficient portfolio, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. I think it's wonderful. Um, I think that um, people should never graduate. I mean, I'm 61 and and uh, I don't own or buy any individual equities or bonds. You know, all of my investing is in low cost, diversified ETFs, you know, super low cost, you know, uh, you know, in cases they're costing three basis points per year, you know, that's um, $300 per million dollars of, of investment. And you know, very professionally and well managed. Um, so you know what I was saying earlier about um, you know how excess risk or how risk eats into compound returns. You know, I think that's a really really important thing. That if you don't think that you can get extra returns by uh, taking more risk, then you shouldn't take more risk. I mean, that's the 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 golden rule of investing is that um, you know I think that uh, the the starting point of everything is that um, uh, that risk and return are connected to each other. Um, and then the corollary to that, though, is that you can get uh, you can get more risk without more return. But to get return, you have to take risk. But but that taking risk without getting return is 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 uh, is actually costly in terms of your it's not a freebie. It's not like, oh, well, I'm taking this extra risk, but um, 
you know, uh, so what if it's a fair risk, you know, it's not hurting me, you know, that I'm not losing money that it, it doesn't it doesn't have a negative edge, but it's eating into your compound return as per the example I gave earlier. So, right. yeah, I mean, I don't think that, uh, you know, I think that it can be interesting to follow, you know, what's going on with different companies and so on. But, you know, for non-professional investors who aren't making their living trying to beat the stock market, you know, I think that, you um, that there's really no time to graduate. <laughs> I think there's there's probably a, a you know a more a more pithy way of saying it, but yeah, I don't think you know I don't I don't. No, view that, that's it, pretty I pithy. <laughs> I don't view it as a graduation. You know, I view it as a uh, <laughs> as going backwards. You know, it's like you know that that I think the older we get, you know, the more we should appreciate how great it is to be able to own a little bit of all the ten thousand companies that are doing business all around the world. Um, you know, is is um, is a wonderful gift of our current uh, financial system, and that we should all, you know, drink from that cup. Okay. Well, look, one of the the more higher echelon uh, investors of the past several decades, you yourself, Victor, is saying, "Hey, for my personal money, I just still stick in these ETFs." Probably says more than anything you could say. So, anyways, thank you so much for sharing your perspective there. Oh, all point. right, now to the book. Um, I assume it's sold wherever books are sold, but if, if, if folks want to go get a copy of your book, where should they go? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 out there sort of everywhere. It's published by Wiley. Wiley's a big publisher. Uh, you know, it's available on on Amazon. It's in hardcover. It's on, um, you know, it's ebook, Kindle as well. And there's an audio version, which is like, uh, you know, but but the hard copy, uh, you know, is is available everywhere. You know, it's probably not, uh, it's definitely not stocked as much as like the Elon Musk book or Michael Lewis's uh, book on uh, Sam Bankman Freed, but it's, you know, it's out there. So you can find it anywhere you can find it. My mom bought a copy on Target, I think, um, was, was stocking <laughs> it. So, so it, you know, it's, it's around, I think, you know, it's pretty, pretty easy to find the missing billionaire is a guide to better financial decisions. Um, and yeah, it, it, you know, it's getting good. It's getting good reviews. It's been at the top of the, uh, uh, investment category and, uh, and and in the number one or two spot in the business and finance uh, category. So it's been doing really well within its within its categories. We're really excited about that. We got a great re review in the Economist, and Bloomberg has written about it. So yeah, we're we're hoping people will continue to uh, uh, to buy it and enjoy it. And um, you know, it's uh, we uh, we we had to convince Wiley to get it out there at a nice reasonable price as well you know so it's not like a, a textbook sort of price it's at a uh just a regular sort of price of uh of popular of popular high selling books right now great well as you've been talking we put the book cover up um we'll have a link to that book in the description folks too so you can go buy it with one click um it sounds like it's doing just great uh and yeah. hopefully you get an additional wealthy on viewer bump uh from this video victor Thank uh, thanks so much for coming on. For folks that have really enjoyed this conversation and would like to follow you and your work, is there is there any place they can go? Uh, sure. I mean, the uh, uh, we have a website for our business. It's called uh, elmwealth.com, E-L-M-W-E-A-L-T-H.com, elmwealth.com. You can find, you know, you can also find me just, you know, with a Google search. Um, we also have a YouTube channel with a couple of short videos there. Uh, I did a talk uh, that sort of uh, gave us the title of the book called "The Missing Billionaires" um, and why we should the puzzle of the missing billionaires and why we should care, which is a TEDx talk that you can find as well. And a, another, I've done another TEDx talk too. So if you say Victor Hagani TEDx, you would find that. Um, but yeah, I think our elmwealth.com website is a go-to place that has links to everything else. All right, great. When we edit this, I'll put that URL up on the screen, Victor. We'll also put uh, links down to all those things, your website, the YouTube channel, the book, et cetera, Thank all you. in the description Thank so folks so know where to go. Um, stick around just for one second, Victor. I just want to give folks uh, some quick resources, uh, additional resources to go look into. Uh, folks, just a reminder that Wealthion's um, fall online conference is coming up like a freight train in just a little over a week on Saturday, October 21st. If you haven't signed up for it yet, go to Wealthion dot com slash conference and if you do that before this sunday you'll lock in our last chance to save price discount and also just as a reminder i won't go into my usual spiel because victor uh, uh helped me mention a lot of it throughout the conversation 
But um, if you are a regular person just trying to figure out uh, you know, how to help your wealth grow for you in the future, uh, particularly if you're worried about some of the macro uh, issues that I talk about on this channel a lot with the, the experts that come on, um, you know, if you're if you're not a, a complete DIYer, which again, both Victor and I think that everybody should be developing their own agency and how to manage their own money, but you'd like some some potential help um, either in figuring out, you know, how to set your position sizing amongst the the uh, investments that you want to be invested in, um, or you know, something more more uh, hands on and, and turnkey than that. Um, highly recommend that most people should be working with a good professional financial advisor who can do all that for them. If you don't have one or you'd like a second opinion from one that does take into account all the issues we talk about in this channel, feel free to uh, schedule a free consultation with the financial advisors endorsed by Wealthion. To do that, just fill out the short form at Wealthion.com. Only takes a couple of seconds to fill out. These consultations are totally free. There's no commitment to work with these advisors. It's just a free public service they offer to help as many people as possible get started on the path that Victor has explained for us in such great depth throughout this uh, this whole discussion. Um, if you've enjoyed having Victor on this program um, and uh, been fascinated by both the story of, of the formation of long-term capital management and the lessons learned from it, um, please uh, encourage Victor to come back on this channel in the future by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Thanks for your patience, Victor. I'd like to give you the last word here in the discussion. Any parting bits of counsel for the viewers? Oh, no, thank you, Adam. No, I, I, I love what you guys are doing. And uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, to get a chance to, um, to, to talk to so many people about uh, these important ideas. Great. Right. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Best of luck with the book and really look forward to having you back on the program again sometime soon. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.